John Sellers, hello. It's uh, excellent to uh, be speaking with you. Yes, yeah, great to see you. Uh, my name is David Feidler. I'm the editor of uh, Stoic Insights, and it's my pleasure today to be speaking with uh, John Sellers, who is one of the foremost scholars of uh, Stoic philosophy in the world today. He's a professor at uh, Royal Holloway, University of London, and his many books include Stoicism, which is the best one-volume history and overview of Stoicism. Uh, another book is The Art of Living, Stoics on the Nature and Function of Philosophy, and uh, most recently, Lessons in Stoicism, What Ancient Philosophers Teach Us About How to Live, uh, which is a beautiful uh, short introduction to the main ideas of uh, Stoicism for beginners. And uh, in this conversation, we'll be discussing uh, Stoicism and the art of living and how ancient Greek philosophy uh, fundamentally differs from modern philosophy in some rather uh, significant ways. So, uh, John, you're um, in London now with your family. It's uh, April 21st, 2020, so we're all locked down due to the coronavirus. It's also the um, day after oil prices in the United States went below zero for the first time in recorded history, so that's not a very good uh, economic indicator. We might need to uh, increase our level of stoicism, but uh, how are you doing over there? Yeah, I'm very well. It's uh, uh, The weather's beautiful at the moment. It's uh, it's lovely and sunny. Um, everything's slowed down and calm. So yeah, I'm coping just fine at the moment. Um, I mean, I'm fortunate I'm not suffering too much adversity, but uh, things are good. Excellent. Well, uh, it's good to finally uh, speak with you. We were at a conference in Athens uh, together uh, a few months ago, and I had hoped to meet you there, but our paths just didn't cross. It was a timing thing. And uh, before we get started, um, I'd like to recommend all of your books, uh, all, all of which I've read. And um, I'd especially like to recommend your recent short book, Lessons in Stoicism, because it's a fantastic book for uh, the general reader. It's very short. You can actually read it in one sitting, and I think it's the best overall uh, introduction to Stoicism available. And uh, the thing that I really like the best about it is the very clear uh, writing style, which also ha has a soothing and comforting um, tone about it, which you don't often uh, find in uh, books these days. So I heard that uh, it's supposed to be published in the United States too. It was supposed to come out in March, I believe, but uh, it's been postponed now due to the coronavirus, and it will be coming out in September from the University of Chicago Press as the Pocket Stoic. Is that is that correct? Yes, that's all. That's all right. Uh, that's all correct. So it would have been coming out around now, but given that all the bookshops are shut, uh, the distribution center I think has been closed. So Chicago have decided they'll they'll postpone it till September, along with all of their other trade titles, just so that. Um, um, they've got a fighting chance when they do come out. Um, but I, as I understand it, it's all, it's all ready to go. Excellent. Good. So uh, to start off this uh, discussion, in your book, uh, The Art of Living, you point out that there are uh, a few ideas in Stoicism that go back to uh, Socrates. And I was wondering if you could explain how this idea of philosophy as an art of living had its origins uh, with Socrates. Yeah, sure. So... In um, in Plato's Apology, um, where he's giving uh, his account of, of Socrates' behaviour um, in Athens, and in effect giving an account of how Socrates conceives philosophy, what he thinks philosophy is, and, and what it's about, um, Socrates um, describes his search for knowledge, right, for uh, in particular, he's looking for knowledge of um, the virtues because he wants to become virtuous. So his project is very much driven by the desire to become a virtuous um, or a good person, right? So it's it's motivated by that idea of, of ethical self improvement. Um, and a kind of you know classic question that we see Socrates ask and that we see played out in Plato's early dialogues is well, how can you become good or virtuous unless you know what virtue is so the first step is about trying to get knowledge of what virtue is and as socrates describes his quest for that knowledge in the apology he looks to craftsmen um, as models 
of um, people who have knowledge, right? So the shoemaker knows how to make shoes, the carpenter knows how to make furniture, and they're not just talking the talk. You really know that they know because they're producing the products, right? You can see the results, right? The doctor um, um, can heal people. The um, the um, the pilot of the ship can get to the port, and so on. There are genuine, real-world results. So you can be confident that that kind of craft-like knowledge um, is the real thing. It's not just um, some pseudo-intellectual talking fine words that all sound very nice, right? And so what Plato and Socrates have in the back of their mind, there are the sophists that were active at the same time. I'm sure that you know all about the, the, the sophists, but if any of your listeners don't, so these are a group of intellectuals who were um, offering to teach people in exchange for money and uh, would say that we can teach you to win any argument, right? We'll teach you all the fine rhetorical turns of phrase so that you can beat anyone in an argument. And this will be really useful if you want to go into a political career, for instance. And so Socrates is deeply suspicious of that kind of claim to knowledge. But the craftsman, he delivers results, right? So it looks as if Socrates thinks that thinking of ethical knowledge as knowledge of an art or craft is a good way to go. And that's really, I think, the background that the, um, the Stoics then want to pick up on and want to, um, uh, want to um, pursue that. And you see that for both the early Stoics and the later Stoics, right? So the early Stoics, people like Zeno, um, uh, Zeno trains uh, or, or is a follower of um, Crates the Cynic before he sets up on his own as a Stoic. And the cynics see themselves as Socratic philosophers. So there's a big Socratic influence there right at the beginning. And then even much later, if we look at someone like Epictetus, say, Epictetus is reading those early Platonic dialogues. He quotes from Plato quite often um, because he's interested in that Socratic model as well. So you see that Socratic influence, I think, through, throughout the history of the Stoa. Right. <clears throat> and uh, I really like uh, the statement that you made in your book, which was, very cl cleverly hidden away in a footnote that you said <laughs> it's possible to actually see Socrates as the primary founder of Stoicism and to see Zeno as the secondary founder. Now, uh, some people might uh, chafe at that idea, but I, I actually enjoyed that. And of course, uh, Socrates, uh, he turned to um, the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi, and of course, on the temple at Delphi, it, it said, uh, know yourself. And we can see that continued in uh, the Socratic idea that the unexamined life is not worth living. So to extend that further, uh, self-inquiry and understanding yourself would be part of uh, philosophy, which we certainly see in the Stoics. You have to understand yourself. Uh, but the other thing you point out is that uh, one of the things that Socrates said is that in the same way that gymnastics is an art, that involves the health of the body, uh, Socrates suggests that there must be a similar art that involves the health of the soul. And uh, as you point out in your book, he doesn't really spell out exactly what the art of uh, caring for the soul might be, but there's the very strong implication that this art would be uh, philosophy. And even though Socrates doesn't spell this out, uh, the Stoics understood what he was speaking about and um, I was wondering, could you explain how it was that the Stoics developed this idea that uh, philosophy is a way of uh, caring for the soul? Yeah, sure. I mean, <clears throat> as you say, it's, um, it's, it's difficult pinning down precisely what Socrates is saying because we're, we're dealing with these platonic accounts and um, sometimes these comments are made in passing whilst Plato in whatever dialogue it is, is arguing, is going somewhere else. Um, and then with the Stoics, we have our own problems because of course, for the early Stoics, the evidence that we got is all very fragmentary. But um, when Chrysippus talks about sort of different accounts of the emotions, he presents those emotions as um, illnesses, as mental illnesses in a sense. Um, and he sees for I mean, he presents philosophy in the in in the fragmentary remains that we've we've got um, as very much concerned with the health of the soul. So it's philosophy that gets us back on track. Um, I, I think it's perhaps worth adding that this isn't a narrowly 
um, stoic idea. So Epicurus as well will will um, uh, pick up on this idea as well. Epicurus will also say that he thinks philosophy is the thing that will restore um, health of the soul. That's what philosophy is all about. So it's part of a kind of a wider uh, sort of uh, way of thinking about philosophy in antiquity, I think. Um, you'll see a number of the different philosophical schools think that um, it's philosophy that's the thing that can save us. Right. So in Hellenistic times, there was a shift away from, uh, for example, the political philosophy of Plato and Aristotle, uh, so that philosophy itself became more focused on um, the individual and how to uh, attain uh, tranquility of mind in what seemed to be an increasingly uh, unusual and out of control world. So both uh, the Stoics and the Epicureans were asking this question, what is ne needed to live the best possible life? Of course, that goes back to Socrates. Um, but they believed that uh, if they could find the answer to this question, that it would be possible to live the best possible life, uh, basically under any conditions. And you mentioned uh, Epicurus as well. And uh, there's that famous quote from him, where he's also talking about um, philosophy as being kind of akin to some kind of medical therapy. Um, he said that empty is that philosopher's argument by which no human suffering is therapeutically treated for just as there is no use in a medical art that does not cast out the sickness of bodies, so too there is uh, no use in philosophy unless it casts out the suffering of the soul. Um, so uh, it strikes me that uh, this kind of approach to philosophy actually uh, uh, diverges quite a bit from um, the way that uh, modern philosophers think about it. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I think, I mean, your typical modern academic philosopher who works in a university doesn't think that they're uh, offering anything that would have any kind of um, uh, psychotherapeutic benefit, right? So, I mean, that's not how we, not how we tend to think about uh, philosophy as a, as a subject today. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess there's a very long, complicated history about how you get from one to the other. Um, Pierre Hadot, who wrote um, a lot about the idea of philosophy and antiquity being a guide to how to live well. Um, he argued that the big shift came with the rise um, of Christianity in the uh, Middle Ages, where effectively Christianity took over what you might call the pastoral aspects of ancient philosophy. So, um, so the Christian religion becomes the thing that takes care of your soul, right? Um, so what are the philosophers left with? Um, um, and he gives an account, or, 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 or someone gives an account drawing on his ideas, I think, talking about the way in which in, say, the Middle Ages in the University of Paris, you've got a division between a faculty of theology um, and uh, a faculty of arts and in the faculty of theology you've got people dealing with christian theology which will quite literally claim to save your soul right and give you all of that psychotherapeutic benefit and in the faculty of arts people are reading aristotle and they're reading aristotle's physics and um, various other works of natural philosophy by aristotle and so the philosophers in the faculty of arts are starting to do the kind of sort of theoretical philosophical inquiry that we would now associate with um, philosophy and uh, uh, and I guess kind of the early stages of, 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 of modern science. Um, so in that context, you get that distinction between one discipline that takes care of your soul and another discipline that's concerned with theoretical knowledge about the way the world works and what we can know and those sorts of um, questions that we're familiar with in academic philosophy and uh, and science today. So that's one kind of, of, of story that's been told about um, how these things have been separated out. Um, but of course, at the same time, there have been all sorts of people uh, in the modern world who who have still thought that philosophy might have some kind of existential impact 
there have always been various kind of outlier figures, right? So, I mean, someone like Nietzsche, for instance, might be a good example of a, you know, a non-academic philosopher or even an anti-academic philosopher who uh, seemed to think that there was something um, existentially significant about what he was doing. And then I guess the sort of the 20th century French existentialists as well, who, you know, um, rather than writing articles for Mind, you write a novel, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Which is going to have a potentially much greater kind of um, uh, uh, impact on the individual and the way they see the world. So that um, that way of thinking about philosophy perhaps didn't disappear altogether, um, even if it didn't present itself as quite so explicitly psychotherapeutic. But there was still that thought that... Um, it was going to transform the way you see the world and and have an impact on how you live your life rather than just being a question of gaining theoretical knowledge. Right. And uh, you can also see that too in the German romantic uh, philosophers too, uh, where uh, philosophy had uh, still some kind of important existential dimension. Uh, But to uh, go back to um, uh, the Stoics, uh, as you point out in your book, the Stoics saw philosophy as a way of uh, curing the diseases of the soul. They saw it as a, akin to being a medical art. And uh, there, were, there were at least some writers who even said that the philosopher was a doctor of the soul. And uh, the Stoics called philosophy the art of living, which the title of your book comes from. And uh, in Seneca, too, we can see this. So uh, Seneca talks frequently uh, using this medical analogy. He talks, uh, he speaks and says that he's offering uh, something akin to medical remedies uh, to his uh, readers. And uh, he also has this great line, the mind uh, prefers to amuse itself rather than restore its health, making philosophy into entertainment when it is really a cure. I like that. So uh, Seneca had some uh, complaints about uh, ancient philosophers as well as uh, the humanities in the same way that some people uh, do today. And uh, I do have uh, one final quote from Epictetus, which is one of my favorites because it's very funny. And uh, he says, uh, a philosopher's school is like a doctor's surgery. You shouldn't leave after having had an enjoyable time, but after having been subjected to pain. So that's where his uh, sense of humor (laughs) comes through. But uh, in any case, uh, so unlike modern philosophy, which tends to take uh, kind of an ivory tower, uh, very intellectual approach, um, oftentimes in which philosophers just want to speak to other philosophers rather than the public too, uh, Stoicism had an intensely um, practical dimension and uh, You did highlight this in your book and the huge difference uh, between them. Um, You had this uh, funny comment in the preface about you quoted a modern philosopher who wrote a book on ethics who said, I personally can't imagine how studying ethics would have any potential impact on a person's life, which is very strange. But anyways, uh, as you point out in your book, um, philosophy uh, was seen as being an art or a techne made up of two parts. So there's, um, there's a part that involves reason or rational arguments, and there's also a practice or a practical dimension. And uh, in the concluding part of your book, uh, The Art of Living, you talk about the idea of uh, philosophical practices or exercises in Stoic philosophy. And uh, you go into quite a bit of uh, depth Uh, how we can find these uh, practices reflected in the works of uh, Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus. And of course, we can find them in Seneca as well. And uh, I was wondering if you could uh, describe what some of these uh, philosophical practices were like in uh, Epictetus and uh, Marcus Aurelius. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I wrote that book the best part of 20 years ago now. So, um, and at the time I was really, um, uh, just really fumbling about trying to get a sense of what those practices would be. Um, in the interim, of course, where, uh, having done, uh, Stoic Week and things like that, um, uh, a, a number of people have spent a significant amount of, of, uh, um, of further energy trying to pinpoint precisely what sort of things might count as Stoic practices and what sorts of things people might actually do. So, I mean, in that process, we've, we've 
spotted all sorts of different all sorts of different things so there's the premeditation of future evils which would be one this idea that you reflect in advance perhaps at the beginning of the day about things that might possibly go wrong and how you would mentally prepare yourself for that and what your contingency plan might be if things did go wrong just so that you're better mentally prepared should things not turn out well so that it doesn't hit you so hard emotionally um, because a number of the Stoics suggest that in fact it's the shock factor that can be the thing that can be particularly damaging and then can knock people over into developing a, um, uh, a negative emotion so to avoid that initial shock can be quite important they argue. Um, another one that we um, that often comes up is the idea of um, taking a view from above so to gain a kind of third person perspective on your life um, and be able to uh, get that emotional distance from what's going on in your life and put things in a much wider context we see Marcus Aurelius use that, that exercise quite a lot um, another one that Marcus Aurelius uses a lot is what I call um, physical descriptions so you find an object that looks superficially desirable the sort of thing that someone might spend a huge amount of money on and you do a kind of a physical analysis of it okay so what is this thing really okay that shiny BMW car that you particularly desire is ultimately just a lump of metal and plastic and in 10 years time it will literally be on a scrap heap somewhere is it really worth paying you know um tens of thousands of, of pounds or dollars is it really worth that to me what is this thing that i'm actually buying um so that kind of physical description marcus aurelius uses um in order to kind of check his value judgments that he's making about external objects and then another famous one that lots of people have drawn on is um um uh, seneca's practice of reviewing his day at the end of the the, the evening um thinking over his behavior during the day what did he do well where did he go wrong did he get angry with people were there points where he didn't live up to the um, virtuous standards that he was trying to reach and and how might he do better the next day um, one thing i'd add is i think one thing that's quite interesting about some of those practices is that um, a number of them are in fact pythagorean um, so that practice of reviewing at the end of the day, Seneca is quite explicit that he learned this from his teacher Sextius. And, and Sextius um, was a Pythagorean as much as a Stoic. He wasn't a kind of a, a necessarily a narrow Orthodox Stoic. And we see it recorded in the Pythagorean Golden Verses as well. And the Pythagoreans had this very long tradition of engaging in these sorts of spiritual practices. Um, so I think that that i mean we're often presenting these things as stoic practices but it may well be that the stoics are actually taking these from an, a, an earlier tradition particularly as i say seneca in particular was drawing was drawing on these um that might be the kind of interesting reflection that we see in the roman stoics um that explains the way in which they often seem to differ from the earlier athenian stoics it may be that this pythagorean influence was bringing all of these practical exercises to the fore um, we don't have so much evidence for the early Stoics that they're engaging in, in precisely those practices. We have some. I mean, it's just hard to know because the evidence is, is more fragmentary. Right. It's very interesting. When I was uh, in my uh, 20s, I was very interested in Pythagoreanism, and I edited a book called The Pythagorean Sourcebook and Library, uh, which contains the four ancient uh, biographies of Pythagoras, along with like the Neo-Pythagorean writings. And uh, according to the uh, traditional you know, Greek accounts, um, Pythagoras supposedly defined uh, philosophy as being a way of life, which, uh, you know, if even half of the reported details about, you know, the Pythagorean school are correct and sort of like Pythagoras's daily lifestyle and things like that, then that obviously would be um, a true statement. So that idea of philosophy as a way of life and philosophy as the art of living actually are very closely uh, conjoined ideas, if not identical. I think um, in uh, when people 
write about modern stoicism, then you have a lot of people drawn to modern stoicism today. I think one of the reasons that happens is because there, there actually are stoic practices. So th those are often discussed and very popular. But um, in your book, uh, you point out that philosophy for the Stoics is not m merely a series of spiritual exercises, but these exercises uh, serve to train the apprentice philosopher in the art of living, so to translate the intellectual doctrines into actions and to transform the life of the would-be philosopher into that of the sage. So um, while these practices would be very important, I think um, one of the messages that I got from your book is that the practices actually uh, exist to reinforce the theory and to make the philosophical ideas real. And uh, so I think what I would conclude from that is that there's really no such thing as uh, what maybe we might call life hack stoicism uh, today, where you can just do like a life hack or do a practice, say, and uh, actually benefit in a deep way from, from it in, in a stoic sort of sense. And I think that, um, you know, what you point out is that as Epictetus said, the practice actually comes after understanding the theory. So you can't really um, sort of like go down the stoic path if you're just focused on one or the other. Yes, I think that's a really, really good um, point um, to stress. So, I mean, for instance, someone could come up with a book of stoic practices and say, do these things, it'll make you happy. And someone can just unthinkingly go through the process of doing those things and it may or may not benefit them. And someone who's doing that, as I say, they may get some benefit, um, but they're not doing philosophy, right? Um, right? As you say, it's just become a series of life hacks, right? Or, you know, you could imagine, turn, you could imagine turning something like this into a religion. You could imagine some authority figure saying, we've decided that these are the things that you ought to do and these are the things that will save you. Just go away and do them. Don't question them, don't analyze them, just do them, right? Um, and, um, and it's really, I think, important to stress that Stoicism is a philosophy and it offers a whole series of arguments for the fundamental claims that it makes. And all of those practices that we, we, we talked about a moment ago are simply designed to digest the philosophical um, truths that the Stoics claim that they've uncovered. So, um, you know, they offer a whole series of reasons why it is we ought not to be concerned about um, adversity. They offer a whole series of arguments about why we ought not to place value um, or think that goodness is to be found in external objects. Um, why it is that we ought to focus our attention on developing our character and why that's the thing that um, can enable us to live a good, um, satisfied life. And you either accept the arguments or you don't. So you need to study the arguments first, right? And to see, do you find it convincing? And then if you do, you've got this whole series of existing bad habits that you now need to overcome. And so the training is order is is there in order to help you try try to kind of rewrite your habits to bring them in line with these new set of of of, of beliefs that you, that you find convincing because you followed the arguments and you think they work. Now, if you don't find the arguments convincing, then stoicism is not for you, and you know other philosophies are available, and you can see what see what um, the Epicureans might offer or 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 whoever else. So. I think that's really, really important. And going through the process of, of, of following these practices may, in a sense, be a bit unthinking. But, um, um, but if it is, it's only because you've already done the thinking in the earlier stage and you've already convinced yourself of the, um, um, the plausibility of the, those fundamental claims. So I think that's really, really essential. And what I've tried to do when I've um, talked publicly about bits and pieces of, of stoicism is to try to go back and focus on those arguments, right? These are the reasons why it is the stoics say you ought not to be overly concerned by external goods, for instance. Um, right. Right. Uh, 
if you're uh, going to have the practices, you need to have the ideas behind them so you can't really separate them. Um, now, uh, there's an interesting uh, quote from uh, Epictetus uh, in your book, The Art of Living, uh, which is one that I've always liked quite a bit. Um, and it goes, uh, uh, do not seek events to happen as you want, but want events as they happen and your life will flow well. And I was wondering if you could explain the meaning uh, behind that uh, to us. Yeah, sure. So I think this connects with the, um, uh, the wider Stoic idea of living um, uh, in accord with nature or living, living harmoniously with nature. Um, so the thought is that if there's a conflict between the way that nature works and what you desire, then that conflict is going to uh, generate discord that's um, going to uh, cause all sorts of problems for people, right? You're not going to be able to, 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 uh, uh, to live a, a calm, happy, tranquil life if you're fundamentally at odds with the, with the way the world works. Um, and in any battle between us and nature, nature's always going to win, right? We're small, finite, insignificant, Nature is the sum total of all things. Nature is always going to win that battle. So there's no point kind of trying to fight against this overwhelming universal power. Um, if we want to live a smooth life, uh, and Zeno described uh, one of Zeno's um, descriptions of the goal of Stoic philosophy was a smooth flow of life, right? So if we want to live a smooth flow of life, then we're going to have to bring ourselves into line with nature rather than expect nature to conform itself to our will, right? Which, as soon as you start to think about it, is just absurd, right? Right. <laughs> you know, why won't and, the whole world conform to my will? Yes, I mean, you know, yes. <laughs> and actually that last uh, line, uh, or rather the last Greek word, I believe in the quotation from Epictetus, it talks about, you know, your life will flow smoothly, and that was probably a direct reference to the idea that, uh, I, I think the quote goes back to Zeno that if you do follow nature, your life will s flow smoothly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one question I wanted to raise is um, how, how does the ancient Stoic idea of God uh, differ from the idea of God that's found in the Abrahamic traditions, for example, Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, because they actually seem to be very different. Yes, yeah, so I mean, so fundamentally, the Stoic God is imminent rather than transcendent. So this is something within nature, um, and I mean, this, particularly the Roman Stoics are very loose with their theological terminology, right? So both Seneca and Epictetus will slide between talking about God um, in a, in the singular and the gods in 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 the plural. And when they're talking about the gods, um, they're presumably talking about the traditional pantheon of Greek or Roman gods. Um, but elsewhere, they'll talk about God, where it looks like they're talking about the Stoic philosophical account of, uh, of God as this animating rational principle that orders and organizes um, nature. And so in that sense, quite different from the God of the Abrahamic traditions. Um, it doesn't, uh, the Stoic God doesn't create, create the world. The world, um, the world um, um, always exists, even if it goes through this process of periodic rebirth. Um, and um, there's some debate that you see in the early Stoa about um, whether even this God was conscious. So you see slightly heterodox Stoics um, in the Hellenistic Stoa saying, well, is this God even, even conscious or is it just this kind of uh, animating um, vegetative principle within nature? So precisely how we understand that is, uh, I think, quite difficult. Um, they want to say that the natural world is alive um, and rather than think of it as, as just sort of dead, inert, uh, matter in the way that, say, the atomists did, 
that seems to be the fundamental claim that they want to want to make nature is alive and self-animating um, and they call that animating principle god now precisely how we cash it out beyond that i'm genuinely not sure i mean the 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 stoics were also well known in antiquity for giving allegorical interpretations of traditional religion right so there's a sense in which they were theologically deflationary right they wanted to play down all the traditional myths and accounts of the of the greek gods and say well when you're talking about all these things all you're really talking about are natural processes so i think it's possible to give a very kind of deflationary account of stoic theology and say well what they're really just talking about is nature um, there's a great line in cicero where he says that the stoic god um, isn't the god of superstition it's the god of physics so what you're really describing is this physical principle that explains how the natural world works rather than anything um, that you might want to start telling stories about um, and if you think about much, much later, so um, a philosopher like Spinoza, for instance, um, not a Stoic, but lots of people have commented on, on um, uh, uh, quite striking parallels between his philosophy and Stoicism. I mean, in Spinoza, he's quite explicit. He just says God or nature. These two terms are interchangeable. Um, and many of Spinoza's early readers in the um, 18th century said, well, he's clearly just an atheist. Because if God and nature are interchangeable terms, then you can just drop the use of the word God altogether and just talk about nature. And although it's a bit anachronistic to apply that to the Stoics, there's a sense in which that's kind of going on. You could describe all um, um, everything that the Stoics have to say about the natural world without mentioning God at all. And you just right. say, nature is rationally organized. And it has to be rationally organized if science is possible, right? Exactly, yes. <laughs> yes. It's got to be regular and predictable and have some you know, order in it, because that's precisely what, what, what our scientific theories track. Right. Um, <clears throat> I wrote a book called um, Restoring the Soul of the World, and it's about the idea of living nature and nature's intelligence. And it's a history of that idea going from uh, the ancient Greek philosophers uh, up through the Renaissance, uh, the scientific revolution, and when it went into eclipse, but now um, the idea is uh, coming back in some way. So basically, it's a history of the idea of nature's intelligence over the entire Western tradition. And one of the things I pointed out in that book is that actually, if you look at any of the Greek philosophers, um, none of them, uh, they might have had ideas of God and divinity, but none of them had this I idea of a, a conscious uh, creator God, um, like we find in the Judeo-Christian tradition that stood outside of the universe and drew up a plan and then, you know, created the universe based on some kind of blueprint. But it was actually some kind of uh, intelligence imminent within the world fabric. And um, if I could just uh, paraphrase, this is a rough paraphrase of a passage from Seneca's Natural Questions. He says, well, you could call God uh, fate providence, you could call it logos or intelligence, you could call it nature, the world soul, or you could call it, you know, natural law. And all of those terms would be correct. Um, so it seems to be something that's really imminent within the universe and a totally different idea from the Judeo-Christian idea. So personally, I, I, um, I don't have any, uh, you know, animus against the term God, but uh, when it comes to Stoicism, uh, I'm actually... Uh, I actually avoid using it because people have this uh, idea of what God mead, means in their mind from the Judeo-Christian tradition. And I find it misleading uh, because if you start talking about God and Stoicism, they're going to not really understand uh, what you're um, talking about. And so um, one of the things that you concluded in your book is that uh, the art of living uh, may form the basis for an ethics, but not for a morality or regulations in terms of how people should act. And uh, I was wondering if you could explain to the listeners what you actually meant by that. Yeah, sure. So in, in modern academic philosophy, people often use the phrase ethic 
use the word ethics and uh, and 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 moral philosophy as kind of uh, as broadly kind of interchangeable, right? Um, these are just two ways of describing the same thing, uh, and and people regularly think in those terms. Uh, but there have been a number of of, of philosophers uh, over the years that have tried to draw a distinction uh, between ethics on the one hand and morality on the other. So morality would be what people sometimes call normative ethics. Uh, morality is something that tells you what to do, right? Uh, morality is full of oughts. Um, ethics, by contrast, is simply concerned with uh, character. So um, ethics is concerned with with self cultivation. Um, so within the, the 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 realm of modern ethical theory, something like virtue ethics, for instance, is concerned with cultivating character. Um, a Kantian ethics is concerned with giving a series of oughts and telling you what to do. Right. So that's roughly what I had in mind with this distinction between ethics on the one hand and morality on the other. And um, morality effectively claims that you don't have a choice, right? There's a specific normative reason why you must do this. Whereas ethics looks like it's more optional. So um, to get technical for a moment, in Kant's terms, morality is a categorical imperative. You ought to do this. Ethics is more of a hypothetical imperative. So if you want X, then do Y. And in the context of Greek ethics in particular, um, I think you know, the vast majority of, of ancient philosophers are uh, offering a line of argument that goes like this. If you want to live a happy life, then do this. So it's a kind of a hypothetical imperative. Now, if you don't want to live a happy life, then that's fine. Don't don't do this stuff. <laughs> there's no kind of there's there's no kind of awe that says that you must want to live a happy life. You must want uh, the mental health that Chrysippus and Epicurus and 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 and, and, and the rest uh, um, talk about. Now, obviously, they assume that everyone does, right? But they don't offer any arguments for that. So. Um, so that's what I had in mind when 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 talking about ethics. Um, it's it's a, a, an optional process of self cultivation, uh, um, if you like. Um, there's no again to come back to the theme of imminence. There's no transcendent source of authority that's laying down what one ought to do. That that's just not not part of the picture. Right. I've I've often thought uh, about ethics in a very similar way. Because if you look at a religious tradition, for example, they'll say, you know, this is what you should do. And this is how, uh, you know, you should follow this rule or the Ten Commandments or, or whatever. So uh, you end up with this very rigid set of rules. And I think that actually to be a philosopher, uh, you can't just necessarily follow rules. In order to be an ethical person, uh, you need to engage in ethical decision making, which is oftentimes uh, very difficult. For example, uh, I, for example, believe that um, in sort of a platonic way that there is, you know, more or less some kind of essential uh, nature to goodness, which actually we can see reflected in the natural world because organisms tend to work in the best possible way and things like that. But let's assume that uh, there is, you know, some kind of uh, essential nature of goodness. Even if you are a philosopher and you know what that is, when it comes to very specific situations, it becomes uh, you know, difficult in some cases to figure out what the right course of action would be and you have to engage in a lot of um, reasoning about it. And you might not always be right either. For example, uh, when I was um, a philosophy professor, I used to tell my students that, uh, well, if I have a hamburger, it's good for me, but it's actually not very good for the cow. So how do you reconcile those two things, even if there is a universal uh, level of goodness? So uh, I think that uh, people need to maybe realize that we need to think critically about ethical issues on a you know ongoing basis and that you can't really be uh, in a sense, you can't be an ethical person unless you engage in it in ethical reasoning and decision-making. So that might make some people angry, but in any case, that's um, 
one of the yeah. thoughts that I've had. I mean, another another element to that distinction I might add as well is that um, on the morality side of things, often the focus is very much on actions, right? So you should do this or you shouldn't do that. Whereas um, in the um, uh, when thinking about ethics in the sort of virtue ethics tradition, the thought is much more focused on the development of, of character. And obviously this is what the Stoics are, are talking about. So you develop the right virtues, you develop the right dispositions. And the thought is then that the right sorts of actions will then naturally flow, right? So rather than worrying about, you know, um, worrying about whether this particular thing is the right thing to do, um, instead think focus on developing the right kind of character so then you'll naturally and automatically do the right thing in a wide range of different different situations so that might be another way to think about that right that's a that's a very good uh, thought so i have sort of a final question here which actually could have been the first question uh in our uh, discussion but um what i'd like to ask you is uh what is the ultimate goal of stoic philosophy because uh people think about it in different ways. Uh, so there's this uh, saying, follow nature. So is the ultimate goal of Stoicism to follow nature? Uh, is it to achieve uh, peace of mind and lead a happy life? Or is it to develop uh, your character in some way? And uh, is it even possible that all those things could be related in some way? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think they definitely are all related. So, I mean, what's the ultimate goal? I, th I think the ultimate goal is, uh, uh, is happiness or eudaimonia. Uh, so to live a good life. Um, that's really what the Stoics and many other ancient philosophers will say. That's the thing that we're all after, whether we realize it or not. That's what the whole thing's trying to get us to. Um, how do you do that? Well, you do that by developing your character. Um, you do that by developing that uh, um, uh, those virtues, those excellences, right? How do you be a good human being? By developing the excellent character traits that, that mark out uh, a good human being. Um, that in, also involves developing your rationality be, um, because they think that's one of the kind of essential characteristics of, of a human being. Um, avoiding those negative emotions um, and so escaping the um, um, uh, the the, the mental illnesses, if you like, um, 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 of um, irrational um, emotions. And then, and living in harmony with nature is closely connected to this as well in two ways, I think. So in one way, picking up on what we were saying earlier about um, aligning your will with the will of nature in order to live a smooth flow of life. Um, how can you live a good, happy, calm, content life if you're constantly struggling, struggling with nature? So you've got to live in harmony with nature in order to avoid that discord. Um, um, but also there's a sense in which um, living in harmony with nature is closely connected to the project of trying to understand nature, right? Um, trying to know how how nature works once you've once you've got that knowledge once you've done that work and i think the stoics would be committed to a, the broadly kind of aristotelian idea right that we're we're naturally rational inquisitive beings um, if you're going to be a good human being you're going to exercise your reason and part of that is going to involve trying to understand the world around you right that's just part of what a good rational human being would do. Um, they'd engage in science, right? Um, I mean, that's certainly sort of Aristotelian view, but I don't think the Stoics are, are, are particularly far away from that. And, um, and many Stoics did engage in science, uh, uh, you know, in scientific research. People like Posidonius and um, Cleomedes and various others. So they were, were uh, Seneca as well in the natural questions. They're all doing this. They want to understand the natural world. And so if you do understand how the natural world works, if you're engaging in that, in that kind of intellectual work, um, then um, inevitably you're going to want to uh, live in accord with that knowledge you've gained about the way um, the, natural world, uh, the natural world works. 
Right. I think that's very important. And um, while we uh, may not look at the world in exactly the same way that the Stoics did, uh, we do have a, a lot to learn from them in terms of the idea of uh, natural law, I think, and the idea that uh, in some way, our own rationality is based in the type of rationality that we find in nature. Otherwise, uh, you're dealing with a large philosophical question of emergence, like how did human rationality um, come into existence if there was no predecessor for that within the structure of the natural world? And it's like Marcus Aurelius says uh, that it's not possible to understand yourself if you don't understand the world. So the study of nature, I think, is uh, very important, uh, not only for the Stoics, but for us today, because um, we obviously need to understand the world in which we live. So um, I understand you have a book on Marcus Aurelius uh, coming out, and you've also written a short book on the Epicureans. So I'm hopeful that um, we can uh, speak again when your book on Marcus Aurelius comes out. We could talk about that. Yeah, that would be that would be great. I I think it's due to come out in uh, 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 around July, so uh, excellent. Not too long to wait. So uh, we'll check back then and uh, see how the pandemic situation is. Hopefully, it will be much better than it is now. And uh, in the meantime, I'd like to thank you for this uh, wonderful conversation. And uh, if you're a viewer of this uh, conversation on uh, YouTube, um, please like the video and subscribe to the channel and turn on uh, notifications so you'll learn about future videos. And uh, thank you very much, uh, John. It's really wonderful speaking with you. And uh, until uh, later, this is uh, David Feidler for Stoic Insights. And thank you very much uh, for joining us.